Section 9, Part 2 of Section 3 of the Introduction of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton. Book 1. Introduction. Section 3. Part 2. The Roman law, as practice in the times of its liberty, paid also a great regard to custom, but not so much as our law, it only then adopting it when the written law is deficient, though the reasons alleged in the digest will fully justify our practice in making it of equal authority with, when it is not contradicted by, the written law. For since, says Julianus, the written laws binds us for no other reason but because it is approved by the judgment of the people. Therefore, those laws which the people hath approved without writing ought also to bind everybody. For where is the difference whether the people declare their assent to a law by suffrage or by a uniform course of acting accordingly? Thus, they reason, while Rome had some remains of her freedom. But when the imperial tyranny came to be fully established, the civil laws speak a very different language. Quod principi placuit legis habet vigorem, cum populi ei et inoim omne sum imperium e potestatem conferat, says Ulpian. Imperator solus e conditor et interpres legis existimatur, says the Code. And again, Sacrilegi instar es rescripto principis obiare. And indeed, it is one of the characteristic marks of English liberty that our common law depends upon custom, which carries this internal evidence of freedom along with it, that it probably was introduced by the voluntary consent of the people. 2. The second branch of the unwritten laws of England are particular customs, or laws which affect only the inhabitants of particular districts. These particular customs, or some of them, are without doubt the remains of that multitude of local customs before mentioned, out of which the common law, as it now stands, was collected at first by King Alfred, and afterwards by King Edgar and Edward the Confessor. Each district mutually sacrificing some of its own special urges, in order that the whole kingdom might enjoy the benefit of one uniform and universal system of laws. But for reasons that have been now long forgotten, particular countries, cities, towns, manors, and lordships were very early indulged with the privilege of abiding by their own customs, in contradiction to the rest of the nation at large, which privilege is confirmed to them by several acts of Parliament. Such is the custom of Gavelkind in Kent, and some other parts of the kingdom, though perhaps it was also general till the Norman conquest, which ordains, among other things, that not the eldest son only of the father shall succeed to his inheritance, but all the sons alike and that, though the ancestor be attained and hanged, yet the heir shall succeed to his estate, without any escheat to the lord. Such is the custom that prevails in diverse ancient boroughs, and therefore called borough English, that the youngest son shall inherit the estate, in preference to all his elder brothers. Such is the custom in other boroughs that a widow shall be entitled for her dower to all her husband's lands, whereas at the common law she shall be endowed for one-third part only. Such also are the special and particular customs of manners of which every one has more or less, and which binds all the copy, hold tenants that hold of the said manners. Such likewise is the custom of holding diverse inferior courts with power of trying causes, 
in cities and trading towns, the right of holding which, when no royal grant can be shown, depends entirely upon a memorial and established usage. Such, lastly, are many particular customs within the city of London, with regard to trade, apprentices, widows, orphans, and a variety of other matters, which are all contrary to the general law of the land, and are good only by special custom, though those of London are also confirmed by Act of Parliament. To this head may most properly be referred a particular system of customs, used only among one set of the king's subjects, called the custom of merchants, or lex mercatoria, which, however different from the common law, is allowed for the benefit of trade to be of the utmost validity in all commercial transactions, the maxim of law being that quilibet in sua arte credendum est. The rules relating to that particular custom regard either the proof of their existence, their legality when proved, or their usual method of allowance. And first, we will consider the rules of proof. As to Gavelkind and Borough English, the law takes particular notice of them, and there is no occasion to prove that such customs actually exist, but only that the lands in question are subject thereto. All other private customs must be particularly pleaded, and as well the existence of such customs must be shown, as that the thing in dispute is within the custom alleged. The trial in both cases, both to show the existence of the custom, as, quote, that in the manner of dill, lands shall descend only to the heir's male, and never to the heir's female, end quote, and also to show that the lands in question are within that manner, is by a jury of twelve men, and not by judges, except the same particular custom has been before tried, determined, and recorded in the same court. The customs of London differ from all others in point of trial, for, if the existence of the custom be brought in question, it shall not be tried by a jury, but by certificate from the Lord Mayor and Aldermen by the mouth of their recorder, unless it be such a custom as the corporation is itself interested in, as a right of taking a toll, etc., for then the law permits them not to certify on their own behalf. When a custom is actually proved to exist, the next inquiry is into the legality of it, for, if it is not a good custom, it ought to be no longer used. Malus usus, abolendus est is an established maxim of the law. To make a particular custom good, the following are necessary requisites. 1. That it have been used so long, and that the memory of man runneth not to the contrary, so that, if any one can show the beginning of it, it is no good custom, for which reason no custom can prevail against an express act of Parliament, since the statute itself is a proof of a time when such a custom did not exist. 2. It must have been continued. Any interruption would cause a temporary seizing. The revival gives it a new beginning, which will be within time of memory, and thereupon the custom will be void. But this must be understood with regard to any interruption of the right. For an interruption of the possession only, for ten or twenty years, will not destroy the custom. As if I have a right of way by custom over another's field, the custom is not destroyed, though I do not pass over it for ten years. It only becomes more difficult to prove. But if the right be anyhow discontinued for a day, the custom is quite at an end. 3. It must have been peaceable and acquiesced in, no subject to contention and dispute. For as customs owe their original to common consent, their being immemorially disputed, either at law or otherwise, is a proof that such consent was wanting. 
4. Customs must be reasonable, or rather, taken negatively, they must not be unreasonable, which is not always, as Sir Edward Cook says, to be understood of every unlearned man's reason, but of artificial and legal reason, warranted by authority of law, upon which account a custom may be good, though the particular reason of it cannot be assigned, for it suffices if no good legal reason can be assigned against it. Thus, a custom in a parish that no man shall put his beast into the common till the third of October would be good, and yet it would be hard to show the reason why that day in particular is fixed upon, rather than the day before or after. But a custom that no cattle shall be put in till the lord of the manor has first put in his is unreasonable, and therefore bad, for preadventure the lord will never put in his, and then the tenants will lose all their profits. 5. Customs ought to be certain. A custom that lands shall descend to the most worthy of the owner's blood is void, for how shall this worth be determined? But a custom to descend to the next male of the blood, exclusive of females, is certain, and therefore good. A custom to pay two pence an acre in lieu of tithes is good, but to pay sometimes two pence and sometimes three pence, as the occupier of the land pleases, is bad for its uncertainty. Yet a custom to pay a year's improved value for a fine on a copyhold estate is good, though the value is a thing uncertain. For the value may at any time be ascertained, and the maxim of law is, id certum est, quod certum redi potest. 6. Customs, though established by consent, must be, when established, compulsory, and not left to the option of every man, whether he will use them or not. Therefore, a custom that all the inhabitants shall be rated toward the maintenance of a bridge will be good. But a custom that every man is to contribute thereto at his own pleasure is idle and absurd, and indeed no custom at all. 7. Lastly, customs must be consistent with each other. One custom cannot be set up in opposition to another, for if both are really customs, they both are of equal antiquity, and both established by mutual consent, which to say of contradictory customs is absurd. Therefore, if one man prescribes that by custom he has a right to have windows looking into another's garden, the other cannot claim a right by custom to stop up or obstruct those windows. For these two contradictory customs cannot both be good, nor both stand together. He ought rather to deny the existence of the former custom. Next, as to the allowance of special customs. Customs, in derogation of the common law, must be construed strictly. Thus, by the custom of gavel kind, an infant of fifteen years may be one species of convenience, called a deed of fiefment, convey away his land in fee simple, or for ever. Yet this custom does not empower him to use any other convenience, or even to lease them for seven years. For the custom must be strictly pursued, and, moreover, all special customs must submit to the king's prerogative. Therefore, if the king purchases land of the nature of Gavelkind, where all the sons inherit equally, yet, upon the king's demise, his eldest son shall succeed to those lands alone. And thus much for the second part of the legis non scripte, or those particular customs which affect particular persons or districts only. 3. The third branch of them are those particular laws which by custom are adopted and used only in certain peculiar courts and jurisdictions. And by these I understand the civil and canon laws. It may seem a little improper at first view to rank these laws under the head of legis non scripte, 
or unwritten laws, seeing they are set forth by authority in their appendix, their codes, and their institutions, their councils, decrees, and decretals, and enforced by an immense number of expositions, decisions, and treatises of the learned in both branches of the law. But I do this after the example of Sir Matthew Hale, because it is most plain that it is not on account of their being written laws, that either the canon law or the civil law have any obligation within this kingdom. Neither do their force and efficacy depend upon their own intrinsic authority, which is the case of our written laws or acts of Parliament. They bind not the subjects of England, because their materials were collected from popes or emperors, were digested by Justinian, or declared to be authentic by Gregory. These considerations gave them no authority here, for the legislature of England doth not, nor ever did, recognize any foreign power as superior or equal to it in this kingdom, or as having the right to give law to any, the meanest of its subject. But all the strength that either the papal or imperial laws have obtained in this realm, or indeed in any other kingdom in Europe, is only because they have been admitted and received by immemorial usage and custom in some particular cases, and some particular courts, and then they form a branch of the leges non scripte, or customary law, or else, because they are in some other cases introduced by consent of Parliament, and then they owe their validity to the legis scripte, or statute law. This is expressly declared in those remarkable words of the statute 25, Henry the Eighth, Chapter 21, addressed to the King's Royal Majesty. Quote, this your grace's realm, recognizing no superior under God, but only your grace, has been and is free from subjection to any man's laws, but only to such as have been devised, made, and ordained within this realm for the wealth of the same, or to such other, as by sufferance of your grace and your progenitors, the people of this your realm, have taken at their free liberty, by their own consent, to be used among them, and have bound themselves by long use and custom to the observance of the same, not as to the observance of the laws of any foreign prince, potentate, or prelate, but as to the customed and ancient laws of this realm, originally established as laws of the same, by the said sufferance, consents, and customs, and none otherwise. End quote. By the civil law, absolutely taken, is generally understood the civil or municipal law of the Roman Empire, as comprised in the institutes, the codes, and the digest of the Emperor Justinian, and the novel constitutions of himself and some of his successors, of which, as there will frequently be occasions to cite them, by way of illustrating our own laws, it may not be amiss to give a short and general account. The Roman law, founded first upon the regal constitutions of their ancient kings, next upon the twelve tables of the Decemviri, then upon the laws or statutes enacted by the senate or people, the edicts of the praetor, and the responsa prudentum, or opinions of learned lawyers, and lastly, upon the imperial decrees, or constitutions of successive emperors, has grown to so great a bulk, or, as Levy expresses it, quote, tam immensus aliarum super alias acervatarum legum cumulus, end quote, that they were computed to be many camels' loads by an author who preceded Justinian. This was in part remedied by the collection of three private lawyers, Gregorius, Hermogenes, and Papirius, and then by the Emperor Theodosius the Younger, by whose orders a code was compiled, A.D. 438, 
being a methodical collection of all the imperial constitutions then in force, which Theodosian Code was the only book of civil law received as authentic in the western part of Europe till many centuries after, and to this it is probable that the Franks and Goths might frequently pay some regard in framing legal constitutions for their newly erected kingdoms. For Justinian commanded only in the eastern remains of the empire, and it was under his auspices that the present body of civil law was compiled and finished by Tribonian and other lawyers, about the year 533. This consists of, one, the Institutes, which contain the elements or first principles of the Roman law, in four books, two, the Digests, or Pendects, in fifty books, containing the opinions and writings of eminent lawyers, digested in a systematical method, three, a new code, or collection of imperial constitutions, the lapse of a whole century having rendered the former code of Theodosius imperfect, four, the novels, or constitutions, posterior in time to the other books, and amounting to a supplement to the other code, containing new decrees of successive emperors, as new questions happened to arise. These form the body of Roman law, or Corpus Juris Civilis, as published about the time of Justinian, which, however, fell soon into neglect and oblivion, till about the year 1130, when a copy of the Digest was found at Amalfi in Italy, which accident, concurring with the policy of Romish ecclesiastics, suddenly gave new vogue and authority to the civil law, introduced it into several nations, and occasioned that mighty inundation of voluminous comments with which this system of law, more than any other, is now loaded. End of section 9